Good afternoon, everyone. You see your chat question. Please enjoy as we wait for others to join us. <clears throat> Uh, Robert, we're seeing your Chrome window. Thanks. So another minute. Jennifer and Greg, can you think of any announcements, logistics, advice? I don't think so. No, nothing comes to mind. Okay. All right, if no one objects, I think we will start. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is uh, lecture five about the metropolis and housing and the role that uh, space plays in architecture and how to look at the history of architecture in a way that uh, is uh, revealed, where forces are revealed by looking specifically at the way space operates um, within and between the buildings that we produce. 
So uh, as is often the case, um, the first topic we look at uh, is a bit of an overarching topic uh, that offers some methods for looking at architecture in a way that reveals things that you might not otherwise uh, be sensitive to. It's similar to the beginning of lecture three, where we talked about um, how buildings mean. Um, that was a segment uh, of that lecture that we hope uh, stays with us and that you can refer to um, as we move through the semester and as you move through your careers. So um, the first, this topic, uh, we call it bodies in space. And it's, uh, it's a recent, relatively recent approach to looking at architecture. Uh, prior to the 19th century, uh, architectural historians and architectural theorists and architects tended to look at architecture as uh, buildings, as objects, as forms, with a focus on the material substance of architecture. Uh, in the 19th century, especially through uh, the work of several German architectural theorists, uh, there became uh, a, a growing sense of the, the space of architecture uh, takes on certain meanings. The example in this slide is uh, uh, an example of land rights. And I'm, I'm using the word land rights specifically avoiding the term uh, ownership because ownership is a relatively new thing. Um, ownership is an invention of uh, a few centuries ago and goes along with the nation state. But this is a mapping of the First Nation peoples. Uh, and you'll notice something very interesting because of the different attitude towards uh, property rights uh, and bodies in space, their colored shapes on the map don't end at black lines. They cross over each other, they overlap. And the next phase, this is a recent map project, and the next phase of it will be a time animation because even these overlapping uh, presence of bodies in space shifted and changed over time. And if we look at Boston, uh, we get a sense of uh, a very different view of Boston if we look at um, this map, if we zoom in on Boston. And this is part of a growing movement that um, is having its greatest uh, impact in Canada. But um, if we were in Vancouver or anywhere in British Columbia, we would be obligated to uh, refrain from doing anything in this class and in this course prior to a pronouncement of this acknowledgement of land, that we acknowledge that we are settlers on the lands uh, that have been um, stewarded throughout the ages by the original occupants of the continent. And so this is becoming increasingly a standard acknowledgement at the beginning of events. Uh, different universities are rolling this out. This one is from a colleague of mine at Tufts University. I've adapted it uh, according to the, the language on the map, uh, the indications on the map of what peoples occupied the lands upon Wentworth sits. So uh, don't be surprised if you start seeing this more and more as you move through life and the world. Um, uh, this awareness of bodies in space does not start originally in the 19th century. It was there before. It's just emerged as, um, as a as an important factor, some people would say it has emerged as the dominant consideration in architectural thinking. Um, uh, it is certainly true uh, if you are moving on in the uh, concentrations, if you choose the urbanism concentration, this is likely to be uh, uh, characteristic of the set of methods that uh, you will be uh, using in that work. Um, Sebastiano Serlio, we've seen him before. He uh, depicted and designed stage sets, uh, reinforcing the sense that all the world is a stage. 
the spaces between buildings are as or more important than the spaces in the buildings. And there has a certain corollary uh, to it here uh, that the people we serve in our architecture are not just the clients, that it's actually the users uh, walking through our architecture and walking uh, amongst our architecture in the spaces that are created by our buildings, that they are the true focus of our work and that we need to serve the, the general public. They are the stakeholders, uh, not the clients who are paying our fees. So it, it, it's, a, it's a struggle um, that puts us back, as we've talked before, uh, deep into the idea uh, that this course is in a way a, a prerequisite or an introduction to the ethics of, of professional practice. Here we see some very famous historic uh, examples where the design of the space uh, is the dominant thing. We don't talk much about these buildings on the left. Uh, we talk about Michelangelo's uh, design for the piazza. These buildings are whatever they need to be to frame, to properly frame the space as intended. It's, so it's not about the building, it's about the space first and foremost, and the architecture is whatever it needs to be to produce that space. Uh, 1748, we have the Noli map. Uh, we've seen it before. We talked about it before. It's in the book. Piranesi was part of the uh, production of this map. And this has been highlighted to emphasize uh, the importance of the spaces that are enclosed by the architecture. Um, and more recently, in the 1990s, uh, the, most, the single most famous and most influential architectural photographer working today, Iwan Bon, revolutionized the way we think and look at architecture by breaking two taboos. First, he showed the context, and even more dramatically, he uh, brought people back into the architectural frame. And this is a, a quick little uh, glimpse of some of his work. Um, every famous architect that you have ever seen, uh, if you can picture a photograph of a famous piece of architecture in your mind, I'm 90% 90, 90 of those photos were taken by Iwan Bon. And he talks about himself as a portrait photographer who is more interested in photographing people in architecturally powerful spaces. Um, and so this is in a way um, the most extreme apotheosis uh, we've seen thus far of how important spaces have become over the forms of architecture and even more so the people that are occupy the spaces of architecture. Um, and so here you see just a sample of some of his more recent photographs. Um, another thing, um, a lot of this lecture has been informed by uh, my teaching of the Concentration Studies I course uh, in the urbanism concentration. Um, and I've asked advice in the revision of this lecture, especially in the wake of recent events. I've asked them, um, uh, my former students that are moving into the senior year, I said, what advice do you have for me? What elements from the, the spring course in concentration studies uh, do you think belongs in, uh, in this lecture? And uh, they really were strong supporters of this thing that I wrote on the whiteboard one day last spring. And they, keep, they kept referring to it all semester long, that there, there's a relationship between architectural design, the project, and systems that operate in the larger structuring of our society and cultures. Uh, and I deliberately did not put arrows here because I uh, believe uh, the evidence supports treating this as a reflexive relationship, that you can start from the project end of this string, or you can start from the culture end of this string, or you can start from the system part of this string, and you can move uh, in any direction back and forth. 
Typically in the thesis program, this plays out in a very powerful way that students decide what culture do they want to change and what cultural aspect they want to have an impact on. And then they work back through the systems that govern our societies back to the project. And they design a project specifically with the purpose of having an impact on systemic forces and uh, on a good day, once you impact the system, you impact the culture, the larger cultural belief systems. Let's look at a, a non-subtle example of how this works in architecture. Let's look at slavery. So last August, uh, uh, the New York Times recognized uh, an important um, landmark date, anniversary for the United States, they made the claim that 1776, for all its importance, is not as structurally at the core of who we are as a nation as August 1619, which uh, is when the first slaves arrived. Now, the key aspect here as an architecture is that uh, you define who is enslaved and who is, is uh, the master uh, by the space of this architecture. And uh, so if you're above deck, you are the enslaver. If you're below deck, you are the enslaved. And the, the powerful quotation from uh, the preamble to this New York Times work um, makes, it, makes a really clear statement about how this group of people who may not have spoken the same language, they've never met each other before, but suddenly they're thrown together in a small space, um, an, an architectural system, and uh, they are suddenly uh, uh, together, they are, this is how race was constructed. They were made black by those who believed themselves to be white. And a really uh, crucial aspect of this about how architecture operates is throughout history, what we see is we see oppressive systems or whatever system, we see architecture in the service of systems uh, that reinforce those systems. And you see the barbaric architecture of the slave ship on the left and on the right, you see something, um, I don't see it on my screen, I have to move this control bar. Um, you see a well-regulated slave trade ship uh, where uh, it's a more humane architecture because the slaves can lay down. So this is historically what architects do. They serve the systems of power. And just as architecture can be used to reinforce and extend and reproduce powerful arrangements, it can also, the thesis of this lecture and of several careers of people practicing today is that if architecture can reinforce systems of power, it can also dismantle systems of power. So that's the, uh, that's the challenge of becoming an architect in this context with great power comes great responsibility. Thank you, Spider-Man. And um, let's see. And uh, the three of us, uh, the instructors for your course, find ourselves in a privileged position. I'm using that word very, uh, very specifically. Uh, we're in a privileged position. Uh, we have a great deal of authority Usually when I begin a class, I start by saying, hello, my name is Robert Cowherd and I am number four to reinforce this arrangement that uh, it's very confusing because you are used to a world, you've been in formal education for a long time and at every step of the way, it gets reinforced to you by the way people behave, the power that instructors have over students, the arrangement of a lecture hall where every 120 people are facing one direction and one person is talking and everybody else is listening. You'd be forgiven if you uh, fall into the spell of believing that 
you are empty vessels to be filled with the wisdom and knowledge of your professors. Well, I'm happy to tell you, uh, or I'm obligated to challenge you to understand that that is not the best way to approach your education. On a good day, we are number four. We are the fourth most important source of understanding. Way before us is your direct experience of the world. And you arrive in this classroom as the world's foremost expert on your own life experience. We cannot afford to have you show up as empty vessels waiting to be filled with our knowledge. You have to bring your expertise every day to this education and to this profession. Um, that's your responsibility. Um, number two, architecture, the methods of architecture, give us all an extremely privileged insight and uh, access to understanding the world in ways that other people do not have access to. And so we use the architectural methods to access the world, to see the world in ways that nobody else has access to. So architecture is number two. Number three, your colleagues are the third best source of understanding. They understand what you're struggling with. They know what you're going through. And you have to be there for your colleagues and your colleagues need to be there for you. Number four, there are some people hanging out amongst you that you encounter for very short periods of time over the course of your week and years of education. They are your teachers. We are the ones who made the mess that you are inheriting. Uh, we are not to be trusted. Uh, everything we say uh, is subject to verification. If you're being responsible, you do not just take our word for it. You check it out, you see if it it's, passes the smell test, and you verify. The important things, you verify. So go along with us as far as uh, you're comfortable, but then uh, you have to verify things. Which brings us to Thursday and Friday section meetings. That is why we changed the course. You are not, when you get to your analysis work, you are not supposed to be spitting back things that you got from your teachers or from books or from the internet. That is not valid. Uh, it is not admissible evidence. What we need is we need you to go back to number one and use your tools of number two to figure out what is really going on, take a fresh look at this architectural history, historical evidence, and let us know what is happening. Um, so not surprisingly, when teachers give you a list of four things and you know there's gonna be a test on it, um, uh, does someone have access to the poll? Oh, there it is. I'll launch it if I can. So here is your poll question. Shouldn't take too long. Let's take two minutes if we need that. It looks like the fastest poll ever. So I'm not going to give it a, the full time. Since almost everyone has submitted. Okay, assuming that many of you are on two devices, it looks like we might be done. So I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. Yes, indeed, a vast majority of you 
uh, got the sequence right, um, world architecture colleagues teacher. Um, you will be tested on this knowledge again throughout your careers, um, so don't forget this. Let's look at Paris. Uh, Ingersoll uh, did a reasonable job of this, but um, we're going to take it a little more, uh, a little further. Um, first, let's start with an understanding. I'm sorry this was um, so fast, but the key element here is to understand that just as the biggest problems that you face in the 21st century are a result of the successes of the 20th century in addressing problems that they perceived. And understanding that, uh, it's useful to look at the 19th century uh, in terms of the most serious challenges that the world faced in the 19th century. Uh, and that has to be uh, the negative side effects of indu the Industrial Revolution. Um, here we have uh, an, an engraving by Gustave Doré showing the miserable conditions that emerged in the industrial cities of England and throughout Europe, wherever the factory system, and I'm using that word carefully, the factory system emerged and uh, reproduced itself across England, uh, transforming the cities uh, and the, li the live livelihoods and living conditions of a vast population. Um, and housing is a key part of the construction of the city in all of this. Um, just as Doré's drawing was a key instrument for communicating a specific point of view about the city, a critical point of view of the city, um, John Snow's uh, map of cholera deaths does something a bit more powerful. John Snow is a doctor and he had an idea that despite everyone's great confidence that cholera was spread through the smells that waft through the air, um, if you notice a, a resonance between this and the COVID uh, situation, um, that's not surprising, that uh, to figure out how these diseases are spread, John Snow made a map. Uh, what we would call today a data visualization. Uh, he created a symbol for uh, how many people died at what addresses, and he located the different pumps. He was testing an idea that cholera is spread through water. And uh, the evidence was very over uh, clear that the Broad Street pump uh, where the clusters of cholera deaths um, existed was the source of the, of the uh, contagion. It took several decades before this became um, well understood and acted upon. Um, similarly, we have this drawing. Um, Friedrich Engels uh, wrote uh, a damning uh, piece. Uh, Friedrich Engels was a young son of a, uh, a factory uh, owner, and his father thought it would be good for young uh, Friedrich to come uh, learn the family business and become a supervisor in his factory in Manchester, England. While walking around the city of England, he noticed the horrific living conditions of the workers, and thus was born uh, communism, uh, was born out of that uh, anal and the urban analysis of that architecture. Uh, uh, Charles Booth went on to document poverty, verifying uh, that the, the, uh, sh the glittering shops of the high street acted as a thin facade <clears throat> behind which these wretched housing conditions of the factory workers, uh, very high density, uh, high mortality, people starving to death. So this reinforces, it's an example on the left especially, of the importance of drawing to figure things out, to make sense of the world. The world is the teacher. Architectural methods of drawing are number two. This is an example <clears throat> of Charles Booth using architectural methods to figure things out and then communicate it. Photography um, came into being during the 19th century. And here you see Jacob Rees using his camera 
to figure out what's going on with the housing and working conditions of uh, the people of the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, the factory work was moved out of the factory into the tenement apartments. Um, they're working near the windows <clears throat> where the light is better. And they are sleeping in the same uh, very small 750 square foot apartments. I lived in one, so I know, um, during when I was an architecture student. Um, and they take shifts sleeping. So scarce was the um, sleeping quarters and so expensive that they uh, took turns sleeping in these types of conditions. And the larger neighborhood, uh, the impact of that was significant. Uh, if you saw Gangs of New York, um, the movie, it shows what those conditions were. And now we move to Paris. This was something that was true in New York, uh, Chicago, uh, in London, and we're gonna turn to Paris for the rest of this segment to look at the horrific conditions, the uh, protests that, uh, that turned into armed rebellions multiple times in Paris, and what was done through the, the mechanisms of architecture to uh, address it. And this is interesting that um, by 1870, the uh, early photography was able to capture some of these scenes, um, the coffins, the barricades. If you've seen Les Miserables, um, the barricades, uh, this, these, uh, that, the, this is the period that uh, Les Miserables um, depicts in uh, the tumultuous transformation of Paris. So Napoleon Bonaparte's um, nephew, Napoleon III, uh, is elected president in 1848, I think, and declares himself emperor uh, and establishes the second empire. Uh, and uh, then he, um, he commandeers extraordinary powers uh, and hands it over to his right-hand man, uh, Baron Georges uh, Eugene Hausmann, who is the prefect of the Seine. Think of him as the head of public works. And he proceeds to transform Paris. Uh, and, and we have very good computer-based maps uh, showing uh, each street transformation and each architectural transformation done in this short period between 1852 and 1870 in the transformation of Paris. And since time is short, this is going to go very fast. Um, the slides will be in Blackboard. Uh, the current link is not to this slideshow, so I'll fix that after the lecture. Um, so there are seven ways that Hausmann uh, transforms Paris. And here they are, uh, one slide at a time, one or two slides at a time. The first thing he does is he addresses the cholera epidemic you see over here on the upper right uh, by creating a secure, uh, clean water supply because uh, uh, they learned about Jon Snow's um, research and, uh, and a sewer system. Uh, friends don't let friends uh, eat where they uh, relieve themselves in the bathroom. So uh, we make sure we collect the water uh, upstream from where we discharge our wastewater. The second one might be the most interesting one given uh, what's happening today, is that um, the narrow streets of Paris made it quite easy for people to uh, barricade streets and take control of entire districts of the city. Uh, and so the transformation um, was necessary to widen the boulevard, widen the streets to make these grand boulevards. And we love the grand boulevards of Paris, who doesn't? But it's got a dark uh, purpose uh, underlying it that uh, it was originally intended for the rapid deployment of a military force to put down uh, the protests and riots of the workers. And here you see uh, our, you know, you remember Marie Antoinette being beheaded in front of the Pantheon uh, by Soufflot. Here is um, the barricades from 1848 in front of the Pantheon. Uh, and to the right, you see a photograph of the barricades from 1870. 
uh, during World War II, the Nazi uh, invasion, uh, incursion into Paris, 1944, and the uh, student protests of May 1968, all with uh, the Pantheon in the background. Um, and so the widening of these boulevards, you see the way it was mapped by the architects on the right. It was very deliberately done in a way to target the worst neighborhoods, the, the neighborhoods uh, the worst as in the neighborhoods that were most likely to rebel in the event of an insurrection. And so it was a deliberate uh, campaign to eliminate the neighborhoods that uh, were the habitat of uh, rebellion and protest. And so it was a massive displacement of the working population of Paris, opening up of the boulevards, killing three or four uh, uh, birds with one stone. Uh, and again, uh, Soufflot's um, pantheon in the background. Um, and part of this uh, opening up of the streets was a deliberate gentrification. This is where we got the word gentrification from. It literally means to uh, create housing for the gentry, the middle class, or bourgeois. You probably have heard the word bougie. It comes from this piece of history uh, in Paris in the 19th century, where the bourgeoisie, the middle class, the property owning class, connecting us back to the original question of who owns the land and why it matters, the property owning class has very strong vested interests to uh, maintain and expand the means of production that is the source of their wealth. Um, they are not uh, the Apple, uh, Bezos, Amazon, but they are the 19% in the world today that make it safe for the the one percent and the one one hundredth of the one percent um, the interesting thing about the image on the right is you have class stratification according to which floor you live on in these beautiful new apartment blocks that line both sides of the boulevards so the boulevards are more than just the street space itself it's a place for carriages before cars uh, the sidewalks where the bourgeoisie stroll in their finest clothing, uh, as in the painting, and then the facades that define the outdoor room, the architectural space of the boulevard. The boulevard is a piece of architecture. Behind the facade is uh, the housing. At the lowest level uh, of this section are the servants uh, that support the wealthiest uh, occupants of the uh, apartment block. Uh, here on the Piano Nobile, uh, the, the wealthiest uh, class live here. Above them, you have uh, a father holding uh, a baby, a mother. Um, it's the family, it's the managerial class. Above there, you see the rent collector uh, trying to collect the rent from this poor worker who doesn't have the money, the elderly. And then finally, in the attics, you have the artists, uh, the prostitutes, the uh, destitute, uh, and the ones most likely to rebel in the case of an insurrection. You have new train stations, like at St. Pancras Station, that become the gateways for the city. Uh, you have uh, the introduction of leisure travel for those who can afford it. And you have these grand Beaux-Arts facades that uh, become a celebration of uh, the new status of the city. And here you see a boulevard, a tree-lined street, uh, aligned with the monumental architecture of the train station, um, uh, which is very much woven into the fabric of the city. Uh, in the distance here, you see the Bois de Boulogne, uh, the largest park of the time in Paris, uh, the tree-lined boulevards that we stroll down in the evening wearing our finest clothes, uh, we are heading for the park. And maybe on Sundays, we hang out in the park as in uh, George Surratt's painting. Um, we have uh, the new innovation of deficit spending. How, were, how was all this work financed? 
it was financed by borrowing money from the future. Um, this was the first large scale uh, use of deficit finance methods to, uh, to fund the large scale uh, transformation of a city. Uh, by annexing the surrounding villages, Paris came to control a much larger uh, uh, collection of real estate that it could use as collateral to borrow and float bonds. So this is a financial mechanism. The land becomes a financial mechanism for deploying vast fortunes that uh, have a tendency to the present to accumulate in ever uh, fewer hands. Um, and finally, our favorite, uh, because it is the most architectural of these, is the staging of grand monumental architecture at these newly created nodes uh, in the fabric of the city. And so we have uh, the plan for the Paris Opera. Uh, where should we put the Paris Opera? Uh, we need to use it as the end point, the visual uh, point at the end of the boulevard uh, to punctuate the, the space of Paris with these huge landmarks of architecture. Um, so those are the seven ways. Um, it, these seven modes of uh, transformation of Paris had a huge impact immediately in cities around Europe and the world. Here we see uh, the fields of fire um, surrounding the uh, fortifications protecting Vienna from the Muslim hordes, the Ottoman Empire. Um, with the invention of cannon, uh, these uh, walls were obsolete. There was no point. The cannons would uh, obliterate these walls. So there was no point in having these walls. Uh, the walls are only as good as the fields of fire, the open fields beyond the walls. But now that um, the Ottoman had cannon and then uh, the Ottoman became uh, valued trading partners uh, to the merchants of Vienna, there was no more reason to maintain all of this uh, military infrastructure. And so they used this uh, cleared area to basically fill, uh, surround the ancient city of Vienna with a new fabric of Beaux-Arts architecture and grandiose monumental open spaces uh, for the parading of bourgeois displays of um, class and uh, to establish the identity of the nation state of Austria at this point. Um, many years later, uh, there was an architect who uh, complained um, and was very critical, uh, claiming that these spaces were way too large. They lacked the human scale that people need uh, it should be considered a series of outdoor rooms, that the space of the city is an architecture. And to uh, do the most of, that we can with the architecture of the city, we should be designing each of these squares, each of these streets as carefully as possible to create human scaled spaces for the citizens of Vienna, not these monumental areas uh, that were overscaled. Uh, a much more positive example um, uh, that would seem to be acting on values similar to the ones uh, espoused by uh, Camilo Cite is Irofons Chirda's uh, plan for the uh, transformation of Barcelona. So you see the ancient Roman settlement of Barcelona that with a few uh, streets cut through, but there came a time in the 19th century when Barcelona also needed to expand dramatically. And so it did with this massive grid. Um, and this is a really interesting example of how uh, Serda was looking at the scale of the human body in the architecture of the apartment in relationship to windows and open space in the interior of the block. And uh, windows and the the space of the boulevard. And that is what informed uh, the design of the block from the small scale out. And then at the same time, he was also looking at the massive urban scale 
and designing inwardly towards the experience of the architecture at the human scale. And so we have a very interesting juxtaposition of, uh, of scales in a single design move, uh, which is at the core of good urban design, good architecture and urbanism. So in a chat to your instructor, um, give an example of a place you've been and use it to, to show how architecture establishes or extends class differences. You might have a question about this question. Uh, please share it in the chat or with your microphone. No questions about this question? Maybe one more minute. Okay, I'm seeing um, pretty much a full house. So um, if you haven't submitted a, a, a one sentence or so a response, please do so uh, while we move on. So uh, from looking at Paris as a whole, one of the clearest examples of the monumental architecture is provided by the relationship between the avenue of the opera and the opera house itself. Uh, so we're going to look at two opera houses, one of them in Paris and one of them in Hanoi. First in Paris, we're looking back. Um, this is the slide uh, we looked at briefly, uh, showing the position of the opera house at the end of the uh, avenue of the opera opposite the Louvre, uh, which used to be a, a palace of the king. Um, and the decision uh, is being tested on the right. Should we have it go due north uh, from the Louvre or go up at an angle? Um, and uh, the result was, let's go at an angle. Uh, but they were, uh, only because they were able to uh, expand their demolitions and make a much larger um, project uh, carved out of the city. And so you see this staging 
uh, of the space of Paris as this uh, grand uh, set for um, the parading of the bourgeois, uh, the new middle class uh, in the streets of Paris. And here it is um, as viewed uh, from a distance and you see, uh, you would see uh, uh, elegant shops uh, lining both sides of the street as you do today uh, with the, this vast, this palatial opera house at the end. Now, when you look at the opera house itself, uh, it starts to provoke some interesting questions. Um, we're used to uh, operas, especially having huge uh, grandiose uh, infrastructures to help create the special effects and the illusions uh, backstage of worlds, uh, the canals of Aida, um, these incredible stage sets that um, characterize the history of the art form that is opera. Uh, you see the fly loft where uh, in order to have uh, scenery that can be raised and lowered behind the actors uh, and the performers, you need a space above the stage that is as large or larger than the stage itself. Similarly in plan, you see here this vast space backstage, the green rooms, the rehearsal rooms, the set shops. It is a, a world of, uh, of the production of the spectacle that is uh, the opera. Now, an interesting thing happens at this project with Charles Garnier is the audience is packed in here in this small space. Then what's happening out here? Uh, what is all of this for? And especially, what is this thing in the middle for? And so if you do the section and plan together uh, in the long direction, you get something like this. And this is not a drawing that anyone, I just took two images and put it together in the slideshow. But sure it would be interesting to have an analytical drawing of this, uh, where what you see is uh, the, the space of the audience is here. The space of the, of the production is here. Um, here you see this vast, area that is responsible for uh, the production and the presentation of the opera. And then you see an even vaster area devoted to the sequence of arrival, uh, promenade, entering in, uh, especially the moment of truth is uh, ascending the staircase up towards the hall. Um, and so let's look at that. So this remarkable stage set for the parading of the audience members, uh, parading in and out, and especially during intermission. Uh, the show continues in the lobby during intermission where the object of this ritual performance is to see other people wearing their finest clothes uh, uh, with beautiful companions to see who is with whom and to be seen and to perform your status uh, in a way that uh, brings you up uh, in the world as much as possible by who you associate with, who, uh, how you display yourself, your human body, uh, and in what spaces you display your body. So this is a very much, a very powerful and charged space within which bodies are are ornamented and put on display. And the, uh, the display continues uh, out on the street. This is an analytical drawing uh, produced several years ago in the urbanism concentration uh, that shows the section, not just through the opera house, uh, through the audience hall, through the staircase, through the lobbies, the entryway, the main portico, the stairway, the plaza in front, right down uh, the space of the boulevard. So here you see an example of an architectural method of analysis where it very specifically treats the space of the city as a piece of architecture. The architecture does not end at the building. 
the architecture has left the building. The architecture doesn't end where the air conditioning ends uh, in your projects. The architecture extends into the site, the setting, the city, the space of society. And so um, the parade down the boulevard would be part of the ritual performance of class construction and class privilege, uh, not just inside the opera hall, but in the space of the city itself. And uh, the architecture of this opera house did another thing. It established an identity, uh, a stylistic identity. Uh, you might hear of the second empire style. This is it, this is it. Um, I don't know uh, if you know any presidents who love gold uh, and Baroque ornamentation, uh, but this is their style, uh, the Second Empire. Uh, it's a Beaux-Arts eclecticism uh, that we are talking about. Uh, we're reading about it in the Ingersoll. It's part this, uh, this part of the course where the stripped down classicism that we were looking at with um, uh, Soufflo, et cetera, is now being reversed. And there's a reintroduction of the Baroque onto those empty spaces where the stripped down classicism had left empty. Um, the cornice lines are now populated with figures. Every one of these figures is an identifiable um, uh, player persona in Greek mythology and French national um, history. Um, and so it's a very complex uh, staging of uh, symbols and icons. And the show on the inside is even more opulent and over the top than what's happening on the outside. This is what uh, Emperor Napoleon used to establish his identity as a ruler and the identity of the nation state of France at this time. The staircase uh, and this performance of class uh, doesn't just happen in the opera house. You see a similar uh, stage set in the first large department store. Thus was born uh, the practice of going to the mall uh, in order to hang out with people, see people, be seen, go do a little shopping, but probably not that much. Uh, this is a moment where going to the mall is part of the ritual enactment of class status. And you see uh, the invention of this new building type, which is the large department store. Uh, and uh, it's kind of like the Crystal Palace, uh, but for sale, uh, where the same ferro-vitreous glass and, and iron architecture is used to bring light into the interior as if you're on a, a climate controlled uh, street. And uh, it, it's hard to grasp at this point, um, but France is not just this piece of land uh, between Spain and uh, Germany. France is a world power at this point. And France, uh, the school children, when they study the geography of France, the teacher pulls down a map and there's a small piece of land uh, uh, on the map that's located in, in continental Europe. But the map of France shows pieces of land all over the world. It shows uh, part of Africa, part, the island of Madagascar, parts of South America, and parts of Asia are all France. Um, and so here we're going to quickly move to Hanoi, where a replica of Garnier's uh, Opera House is built in the city of Hanoi uh, as part of the project to establish a capital of French Indochina, the French colony uh, that we now call Vietnam. And so we have, we have the building, uh, in all of its uh, glory and uh, Second Empire style, uh, eclectic Beaux-Arts. Uh, and we also have its positioning at the end of a new boulevard uh, that is uh, constructed in Hanoi. Uh, Hanoi has three zones up here where it basically shows uh, blank 
uh, large blocks. Uh, that's uh, the way colonial uh, architects mapped um, indigenous uh, habitat, in indigenous populations and their neighborhoods, uh, because it was too dense to even think about. So we just show it as one large block of color. And then we have the infrastructure of uh, industry and commodity extraction. That is the whole point of the colonial project, is to extract the wealth of the natural resources of the colony as quickly and cheaply as possible, um, using a labor force that lives in very poor housing conditions up here. And then you build the European city. And so you see the opera house sitting here at the end of the boulevard. You see a train station here at the end of the boulevard. You see a vast uh, exposition grounds and an exposition hall here, yes, at the end of a grand boulevard so that these places um, can be seen from a distance. And here you have uh, an Eiffel Tower built on its side that becomes a symbol of European civilization, uh, bringing the good life to uh, the poor brown people of Asia. Uh, and so this bridge built by uh, Eiffel uh, becomes a very important symbol uh, uh, up to the present. Uh, the Exposition Hall, um, shortly after establishing Hanoi, which is part of the establishing of Hanoi as the capital city of, um, of Vietnam. Now a little bit of uh, reproduction with difference. We see uh, a replica of the Bibliothèque Saint-Geneviève um, by Soufflo, not by Soufflo. I'm gonna correct that. Um, where you have the um, iron ribs uh, and the slender iron columns. Uh, basically, this is a reproduction with difference. The triumphal arch on the facade, uh, the Second Empire um, decorative sense treatment of the facade um, in, in the reproduction of French architecture here uh, in French Indochina. So um, here's a chat question opportunity for everyone. Using uh, similar to the last chat, using an example of an experience of ritual performance of class status, how can architecture play a role in class differences? If you have a question about this question, um, you can turn on your mic or share it in the chat. Do you elaborate on ritual performance? Um, when I go to church on Sunday, I pay attention to what I wear and um, I try to behave well and I try to impress uh, the, the people who can see me. At the same time, I'm looking around, and if Jimmy is misbehaving again, um, you know, I'm making note of it. That is a ritual performance that occurs every Sunday. When I show up to class, uh, I make sure I don't wear the dirty t-shirt I've been wearing for three or four days. Um, I actually take a shower and uh, put on one of my favorite shirts. Uh, I'm ritually performing uh, according to my status as professor. So I'm confused because it's asking two things at the same time. It's asking how does ritual performance show class and how does architecture play a role in class differences? Um, good point. Uh, I would state it as um, using as an example, um, what is the role of architecture in the ritual performance of class? Thank you, much better. Show us. Missouri rules, show us how architecture plays a role in the ritual performance of class. It always gets better when you ask questions. We're only number four after all.
So another 20 seconds or so. I have more responses than I have students. So I think, uh, is it looking good on your end, Jennifer and Greg? Uh, yeah, it's looking pretty good. Uh, yeah, I got the count, but I think just as a quick glance, it looks good. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, it, you can uh, continue, if you haven't submitted yet, you can, uh, as we move on. Um, so, uh, as you might guess, um, these, these forces operate in ways uh, that go beyond class, uh, reproduction, class construction, class status. Uh, in the context of colonialism, uh, we have uh, architecture as an instrument for production of subject positions of those who are colonized. Um, and so I want you to think as we go through this, what does space have to do with power? Um, one of the preliminary examples of some of these strategies comes to us from Rome and the pilgrimage church uh, uh, practices of Catholicism. Um, those of you who are Catholic may be familiar uh, with the practice of um, using pilgrimage uh, to gain indulgences, which uh, can give you time off from the time you spend in purgatory uh, between dying and the judgment day. And so one way you can shorten that time is you can make a pilgrimage to Rome. And so, uh, and this was a huge source of income for the Catholic Church. So they advertised it with pamphlets like the one you see on the left. And then uh, they transformed Rome in order to make Rome work better as a, a machine for pilgrimage. And so they opened up boulevards uh, to, uh, so that when people arrive in Rome at the Plaza, Piazza del Popolo, uh, I gotta put my Italian on here, um, you can see the destinations of the uh, pilgrimage, um, your pilgrimage destinations as depicted in the pamphlet. And so this was something that predated um, Haussmann's uh, transformation of, of Paris. Uh, we also have the examples that build on this of the Palace of Versailles. Uh, off in the corner of one of the slides, you could see how these grand axial visual corridors of Versailles are connected with the visual corridors created by Haussmann's Paris. So it's very much a large spatial armature that can cover uh, large pieces of the planet Earth. And here you see another depiction of Paris. Um, now, these approaches were then applied to uh, the colonial holdings as we saw in Hanoi. Now we're gonna look at uh, how it operated in Casablanca, a coastal port uh, city in uh, the country we now call Morocco. And so Casablanca had an original, just like in Hanoi, well, not just like it, but as in Hanoi, there was uh, Robert. Greg, are you hearing anything? I don't know. I'm not hearing anything either. Okay, I think. And everyone else seems to be active so i think yeah. we lost him temporarily but he'll oh he's doing back you're on mute robert how about now good what's the last thing you heard you might want to start this slide over mm -hmm. yeah take two can't remember what i said just as we saw in Paris and Hanoi, uh, the French used uh, this form of the city and the architecture uh, in specific locations 
to create uh, spaces of power in the port city of Casablanca in the country we now call Morocco, but was part of France uh, uh, starting, well, unofficially in 1906. Um, so we're now in the 20th century with this example. Uh, every uh, Islamic city has a historic quarter um, where it looks like chaos, but is actually the product of very strict rules as put forward in the Quran and the Hadith, uh, which is a very interesting example if you ever get a chance to look at it. So the three zones, just as we saw in Hanoi, is the indigenous Medina where the worker and working population lives, the port infrastructure uh, where the uh, devoted to the rapid and cheap deployment uh, of extracted commodities back to France, and then the European city where uh, the architecture and the urban form performs the task of making the city suitable for European occupation and to demonstrate power both to the oppressed working uh, indigenous population, but also demonstrating power to the colonizing population, to reassure the colonizing population that um, the police have their back, the military are gonna control the indigenous working population. Uh, and the, it's not just the police force that is performing these tasks. They're performing these tasks within the armature, within the equipment, within the infrastructure of the urban spaces of power of Casablanca. Sound familiar? So you have a French uh, monumental city filled with French, uh, surrounding French spaces, these French monuments creating French spaces, very much uh, directly out of the playbook from Haussmann's transformation of Paris. But you see a little bit of a difference here. The interesting thing that we're going to look at this week and in future weeks is that the architects, rather than remember back uh, in India, where uh, the British used classical architecture of the government house, uh, reproducing Kettleston Hall with a difference with pure Greek Roman architectural forms to demonstrate we are the superior civilization. We are the inheritors of the Greek and Roman and the Renaissance uh, ideals of human civilization. Um, here, they're doing something different. They're saying, sure, grandiose monumental architecture in its bones, it is a French monumental architecture, but in its outward expression, in its cornice, in its decorative uh, friezes, in its carved, uh, carved bands here, in the portals, it is saying, we get you colonial, uh, uh, colonial subjects. We get you indigenous population that is working every day in the mines, in the fields, in the ports to help us extract the wealth out of Africa and into Europe. We get you. Um, so this, you see a different strategy here, which is um, the idea of Lyoté and Prost, both of whom have experience back in French Indochina. And you see uh, a careful study of Islamic motifs. You see the employment of Islamic craftspeople, the employment of materials of the culture. And it's, an, it's a hybrid, um, some might use the word syncretism, um, uh, but I don't think that's, it doesn't go deep enough to qualify for the word syncretism. But uh, they're looking for empathy. They're trying to create an empathetic situation here. And these uh, buildings exist to the present such that um, you can see that uh, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie. And did I freeze? Okay, I'm going to assume you can see that Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie movie uh, that takes place in Casablanca. And it looks, even though it was filmed just a few years ago, it looks just like it did a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, a statue to Lyoté, the, the French overseer. Um, so despite all the sympathy 
uh, empathy, the empathy embedded in the architecture, it was still an oppressive situation. Uh, it's kind of like uh, making a better slave ship. Um, sure, the slaves can lay down. Sure, the, the housing uh, is a little bit um, more spacious. They have a little bit more access to light and air. Thank you very much. But it's still architectural design, uh, incremental improvement in the architectural design standards in the service of a larger system and that system is in and of itself oppressive. So it's part of the professional ethics of the course. Um, how do you, what role do you play as an architect? Do you make things ever so slightly better inch by inch, year after year, uh, pretending that that's enough uh, to make, make uh, to add up eventually to a significant change? Or do you need to do something else? At what point is your architectural design more than just an incremental change? At what point is your uh, carbon footprint not, uh, not it, when, is, when is it not enough just to pollute slightly less than the other guy who, who you beat the, the, uh, the contract for? Um, these, it's, a, it's a tough question that we face as architects and as citizens of the world. At what point is incremental change not enough? So, let's see. so which brings us to chat question. Uh, if you were Prost, the designer of all of this uh, empathetic um, architecture, this French monumental architecture with indigenous icon iconography embedded in its decorative strategies, uh, would you uh, at what point do you uh, choose between dominating through a demonstration of your superior civilization, the Greek and the Roman, and at one point do you um, work in the project of creating a hybrid where your monumental European structures are, uh, expre are expressive of local values? Again, you may have a question about this question. Please uh, share it on with your microphone or on chat. Robert, may I, oh, sorry, may I make a quick comment about the question? Yes, please. Uh, I just want to make it very clear to the students that we're putting superior civilizations in quotes here. Um, we are not at all saying that these are superior civilizations. We're saying that that's how they viewed and tried to present themselves. So we just want to be super clear about that. Um, somebody was about to ask a question. Please go ahead. I was about to ask, is this, are we like looking through the lens of Prost trying to subjugate the people of Casablanca or trying to do what's ethically right? That is up to you, young man. Good question. <laughs> So does that mean we're pretending to be um, him and sort of inputting our personal opinion into the question? My suggestion is to be clear whose position, uh, what position you're taking. You could, you could say, uh, because I'm Prost and I'm part of the colonial administration um, and I've devoted my entire life to greasing the wheels of the machinery of repression, I would do this, right? You might do that. Or you might say, um, even at the time, Prost should have known better and he should have rejected both of these options. Oops, I'm leading the witness. Just to clarify, when you say superior civilizations, you mean like, for example, how the French were to the Vietnamese and Roman and Greek? Um, it's more specific than that. The examples we're showing is throughout history, the values of the Parthenon, uh, the Greek architecture, is continuously rolled out as um, a symbol of the highest aspirations of the human civilization, again in quotes. So who is the uh, banner who is, carrying, who is carrying the responsibility on their shoulders for human progress uh, symbolized by Greek and Roman 
values. Does that help? <clears throat> Maybe another 30 seconds. I actually have a number of students who still need to answer maybe another minute or two. Sure. I, we, we talked a lot about the questions. So. Yeah. Another 20 seconds. Is that good? Um, sorry, I lost count. I have about 28 out of 40, so maybe a, a little bit more time. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm at about 30, 31 right now. How about now? Uh, 
I still have just a few students. Um, so maybe if they want to wrap up their thoughts, but we, I know you have another section to get to. So. Yeah. yeah. It's the last one. So if you can um, respond um, in the background, um, I'll move on to the final section where we come to the United States. And uh, I'm throwing open the question, can architecture and urbanism be an instrument of oppression? And I suspect um, this is more than just a yes or no question. It's really a question of how, how can you tell and what can you do about it? So let's look at Chicago. Uh, back in the United States, where we started with the first slaves arriving in 1619, uh, 400 and one half years ago. Um, Thomas Jefferson, not surprisingly, uh, as part of his uh, architectural impact on the young United States, proposed that uh, on the far side of the Appalachian Mountains that we lay out a grid. This grid, as we talked about, or as Ingersoll, as we see in the reading, um, the grid is a very powerful mechanism of rapid reproduction of housing. So if you're an architect, you can design a single tenement building for one block of New York City, and it will work uh, everywhere throughout Manhattan because Manhattan is laid out on a grid. Similarly, by laying out a grid across the United States, uh, even before uh, it was part of the nation state, um, speculators could buy and sell land uh, in exchange halls, like the one we saw in Amsterdam, in exchange halls in the cities of the East Coast, uh, land was bought and sold in uh, across the United States before anyone uh, could ever see it. Uh, it was a theoretical piece of land that was laid out ahead of time according to the architectural drawings that are the maps of the grid system that um, covers the entire continent. So this architectural mechanism of the plan, of the grid plan, allowed, uh, became an instrument for very rapid buying and selling of land to drive, which created a land, a real estate market where fortunes were lost and gained uh, in a few hours from morning to afternoon, someone could be, become a, a millionaire uh, very quickly in the speculation. And in that context, there were several cities that were, that were uh, after the Louisiana Purchase, after the French uh, were defeated in Haiti and they had all these war debts, Napoleon had all these debts, he had to sell the Louisiana Purchase to Thomas Jefferson uh, to get some money to fight the wars of France and Europe. Um, the Louisiana Purchase was laid out on a grid and the competition between St. Louis, Chicago and dozens of other uh, local outposts in the frontier commenced. Um, because of the uh, forceful domination of New York City, uh, Chicago won the competition. Uh, the New York financiers forced Louisiana, uh, I mean, St. Louis out of the running and established Chicago with the primary hub of extraction. And you'll notice it's a similar language to what we saw in Hanoi and in Casablanca. Chicago became, for all intents and purposes, the equivalent of a colonial outpost that whose primary purpose was the rapid, large-scale extraction of raw materials as quickly as possible for the least amount of money. And the two key ingredients in that was land and labor. And the land is uh, controlled by the grid system that stretches across. Uh, finance was produced by the way that grid system allowed speculation. And later the railroads were financed through a similar mechanism. And then the labor concentrated in Chicago, um, we'll see, we'll look at the housing. So the grid system across the continent 
is mirrored uh, the same logic is operating at a different scale uh, with the uh, the cattle yards of Chicago, uh, where you need to uh, control uh, the livestock uh, who would walk to Chicago under their own strength. Uh, and then here you see the pigs. Uh, sorry for for the goriness of this, but the pigs would walk just as the cattle would walk to Chicago under their own power. Uh, so that it was cheaper to transport them for the slaughter, the pigs would walk to the top of the slaughterhouse. And from the third floor, they would be chained to this wheel. Uh, and then uh, the throats slit and the weight of the carcass would drive the wheel uh, and turn the chains and uh, create the power source for the slaughterhouse. So this, it was a stinky, smelly, dirty, uh, horrific business of commodity extraction. Uh, the uh, refrigerated rail car uh, put uh, the, the local butchers in towns around the United States out of business and Chicago became the butcher shop of uh, the country. Um, as Chicago became more and more wealthy, they wanted to uh, stake a claim it being more than just uh, a slaughterhouse, a city of death. And so they hired architects to put this fancy gateway, again, using Beaux-Arts strategies, this fancy gateway on the stockyards of Chicago to give it a little bit of uh, dignity and class. Um, uh, on the, at the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the United States, uh, Europe, uh, started to look over at the United States and say, wow, there's a lot of wealth happening here. There's a lot happening. It's a land of opportunity. And Chicago, uh, as we saw in the, uh, the, the rise of skyscrapers, uh, the wealth of Chicago uh, uh, made it a place, uh, made it a candidate for uh, a renaissance of culture. And so uh, Chicago established itself in part through its architecture as an American Renaissance. Um, just as we were talking about how Greek and Roman uh, values as embedded in the architecture became important vehicles for claims to uh, being the uh, standard bearer of civilization, of human civilization and in this case of Western civilization. Uh, and so um, 1876, the centennial of the establish establishment of the United States, fast forward to 1893, where you have the, um, the 400 year anniversary of uh, Columbus uh, arriving, of European arrival in the United States uh, as a positive thing. It, it was considered worthy of celebration. And so uh, they staged the World Columbian Exposition in 1893 in Chicago. And uh, a Boston architect, Daniel Burnham, was put in control, in charge of the design and layout of the exposition. And so he used a Beaux-Arts style of architecture they invited all of the top architects of the United States uh, to uh, contribute their designs for this incredible exposition, which had an enormous impact on the identity of the United States. Just as we saw architecture and urban form deployed as a strategy for establishing the identity of the nation state, you see it again here uh, in the Columbian Exposition. And uh, the setting and the uh, architecture uh, gave it the name, the White City. Uh, the last time we saw the White City was uh, when the British established uh, the town, their, their European town in Madras, uh, India. They built an architecture of classical uh, proportions and expression and they called it the White City. They drew a line, and on the other side of that line was the Black City. 
And so uh, you have this very explicit white black segregation of cities in the context of colonial India. Uh, what you have here is uh, resonates and rhymes with that history uh, where you have the white city becomes a movement uh, and it becomes evidence of the United States as the standard bearer of Western civilization and the values and the deployment of Greek and Roman architectural forms now in a Beaux-Arts eclectic uh, hodgepodge. Um, and Daniel Burnham goes on um, from the great success of the World Columbian Exposition of 1893 to um, produce a plan for the city of Chicago uh, with a lot of the same strategies that we saw in Haussmann's Paris. And so you see uh, a vast grid system um, that was part of Jefferson's expansion. Uh, and then cutting through that grid, you see the diagonals that we've seen previously in Washington, D.C. Um, and Paris as a way to establish the monumental armature of the city of Chicago so that uh, you, uh, it doesn't take too much of a walk to cross a grand boulevard the end, at the end of which is this grand piece of architecture to reassure us and uh, to remind us that um, the power of the government, the power of uh, Chicago is intact and don't you forget it, here's the evidence, look at the architecture. Um, and remember this is in the context of commodity extraction the mid, the middle, uh, the Midwest becomes the the breadbasket of the world, uh, and uh, a huge volume of wealth of commodities and wealth uh, is produced and extracted and concentrated, because Chicago is designed the way it is in the context of the larger landscape of the middle of the United States. Um, this is very much the uh, the work. Uh, these ideas come out of. Uh, William Cronin's uh, Nature's Metropolis, a book um, that came uh, out about 20 years ago. Um, Daniel Burnham uh, was so successful in Chicago that every city around the United States had to have uh, a piece of this. If you are the mayor of Cleveland and you want to uh, increase the civic pride of your boosters, you want to get reelected, you want to assert the glory of, of uh, Cleveland and the power of Cleveland, uh, who are you going to call? You're going to call Daniel Burnham or other architects who are producing this type of architecture. Um, not all of this was built, very little of it was built. The Civic Center on Venice, um, I think that's where it is right there. Am I getting it right, Jennifer? That's the Civic Center on Venice, right? Yeah, that's it. Right there. So um, this was built in Washington, D.C., um, where you see uh, these images from. And here's Cleveland, where uh, you see a city beautiful. Um, th this goes on to become known as the city beautiful movement. And it's the use of architecture in the Beaux-Arts style to create the stage set around which uh, civic space, monumental civic space, can be created for the performance of um, Fourth of July uh, festivals, uh, but the ritual performance of power in the service of a civic attitude towards being a resident of Cleveland, in this case, and a citizen of the United States. And so this was something that swept across the country and beyond. Um, Daniel Burnham designed a civic center for uh, Manila in the Philippines when it was a colony of the United States. Yes, the United States have had colonies. Uh, and here you see a depiction of a similar strategy at work uh, in uh, the British colonial capital of New Delhi, which will be seen in future weeks as well. Now Chicago, uh, while we're on the topic of Chicago, uh, Chicago also is, uh, has a long history um, in terms of this, this question of 
uh, the white city as distinct from the black city. Uh, racial segregation in the United States um, uh, is a legacy of a specific moment after the Civil War. The Civil War uh, uh, ostensibly and officially and legally freed uh, the enslaved population. And for uh, a short decade or so of the period we call Reconstruction, uh, uh, the citizens, uh, the previously enslaved citizens of the United States enjoyed um, a relatively active engagement some were uh, uh, elected to the Senate, uh, positions of great power and authority. They became prominent members of, uh, of society, um, wealthy. Uh, and it was a brief moment, a brief spurt of um, a hopeful moment that was abruptly cut short when there was a contested election. Uh, and uh, in order to resolve the election in favor of um, the, um, there, there was a deal that was cut that basically the federal government, in order to resolve the election, had to withdraw the troops of the United States from the southern states, uh, the, the former Confederate states. And um, that was the birth of the Jim Crow South. It was slavery brought back in by another name. And in the context of Jim Crow United States that lasted from um, 1872 until uh, 1965, that's the, the period of the Jim Crow United States, um, there is a practice called redlining where it was illegal for any federally guaranteed lending institution, any bank, to give a loan to a homeowner who lived in uh, certain neighborhoods. So uh, the term is called redlining, but it's actually, uh, it's not red lines, it's red zones on the, the, uh, the banking maps. There are some neighborhoods where banks were allowed to lend money and some neighborhoods where they were not allowed to lend money. And um, uh, if, if I asked you to guess, I suspect you'd, you would know. What's the difference between the neighborhoods uh, that are colored red and the neighborhoods that are colored green? Um, there's only one in this map. Um, but let's, uh, let's look at Boston. Um, so Boston, uh, back in the day, uh, this is the red line map uh, of Boston that tells us uh, where um, there are uh, black populations living in the neighborhood. And so by law, banks were not allowed to lend money to homes in the red zones. And uh, as a secondary impact of that is if, um, if someone had a house for sale in a green zone, like in Brookline, or some of the wealthier neighborhoods of Boston, uh, they, uh, if they attempted to sell their home to a black family, uh, the, the neighbors would step in and stop it. And so um, this book that came out in, uh, in 2017 by Richard Rothstein makes the case um, that when uh, reparations are uh, happen in the United States, um, it will be because of people like Richard Rothstein who take the, the Supreme Court at its word. The Supreme Court has ruled that if uh, non-white populations prefer to live in certain neighborhoods and so choose to live in certain places as a matter of consumer choice, then there is no grounds for uh, reparations. Um, that there's no legal uh, liability by the United States of America. Um, in order to have legal liability for the US government uh, to pay reparations for the uh, centuries of oppression, you would have to prove that the mechanisms of the government of the United States were responsible for 
uh, the difference in um, a, or limiting the opportunities for non-white families. Um, Richard Rothstein takes redlining and makes a very clear case that the banking regulations as uh, as directed, as um, put in place by U.S. federal lending practices, constitutes a legal limitation on where some U.S. citizens are able to live and where they cannot live. And so um, this is uh, a way of showing how property values, land, uh, the form of the city, the architecture of the city is very much a mechanism by which these larger systems are either dismantled or reinforced and reproduced and handed down generation after generation. If we look at the uh, dissimilarity index of different places where you see uh, uh, racial, uh, racial identity identified in different colors, you see extreme concentrations according to race. Um, is this a coincidence? Is this a matter of consumer choice? Or is it a matter of systemic uh, structures that uh, uh, determine, all but determine the outcomes of uh, where people live, the kinds of conditions they live in, what their school system is like, what opportunities they have available to them, what policing standards are applied in different neighborhoods, and on and on and on. So uh, it all comes back to who owns the land, what are the rules that um, determine what someone can do with that land. Um, I apologize for running late. Um, I, it struck me uh, looking at the news uh, this past weekend, just how common it is, just as we saw in Paris, there was always the pantheon in the background in depictions of protests. Here we see state capitals, which uh, were all produced at the moment uh, of the White City uh, World Columbian Exposition. Uh, this one's a little earlier in Philadelphia um, and here at the White House. All of these spaces where these protests are taking place are charged spaces meant for the reenactment, the ritual renewal of devotion to society and to uh, the power structures of the government. And these same spaces are being used to take it back. So um, that's it. Here's the last question. It's the same question you got last time in a different context, I hope. So uh, if you have time and can respond to this chat, great. Uh, if you don't have time, I know we ran late. I apologize. Um, this is not something that we will hold you responsible for, but we do hope you find this to be an interesting question set in the perspective of uh, this history uh, presented uh, using these methods of analysis. So this is an optional chat question. Uh, if you can stay, great. If you cannot, thank you very much. Um, we will see you in section. If you have a question about the question, please um, ask it in the chat or using your microphone. Thank you, everyone.